I want to start as I always start, which is reminding you about the, um, about the project. I really want to make sure that you are, the final project, I really want to make sure that you are on board for that um, and that you have a plan. And if you have any questions, please email either myself or Sam. Um, so delighted to have today, two speakers today, um, Warren Belasco and James Foster. Uh, Warren Blasco comes from the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. He's the professor of American studies there. He's been a pioneer in a multidisciplinary approach to food um, and has um, he's got 25 years of experience um, in, the, in the area and um, for the past five years has been editor of Food, Culture and Society, uh, which is an international multidisciplinary research journal on the topic. Um, uh, associated with many um, universities and has written books, one of which was assigned for you to read from, um, Food, the Key Concepts, and his most recent book, which came out this year, last year, very recently, Meals to Come, A History of the Future of Food, 2006. 2006. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, and then we have um, James Foster from um, George Washington, um, he's uh, received his PhD in economics from Cornell and then went on to Purdue University, Vanderbilt, and Elliott School, and uh, is now the Elliott School. <laughs> he's been a visiting professor at the London School of Economics, Cornell, X X Essex, Oxford, Harvard, University of Americas, and Puebla, Mexico. His research focuses on welfare economics, using economic tools to evaluate the well being of people. His joint 1984. Econometrica paper is one of the most cited papers on poverty. I'm delighted to have them both here today. Thank you. I'm going to stand off to the side here and use the uh, slides. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, every time I come down to GW, there's a new building, it seems like. So it's, it's very interesting seeing what's going on. Um, I, I have been teaching about food, these kind of food survey courses for uh, a number of years. And, um, and one of the things I noticed in the rhythm of the semester, and it seems similar to your, uh, your syllabus, is that we often start the course with what I call the oh wow uh, aspect of food, or, you know, the, the magic of food, the incredible skill and diversity and the in innovation and ingenuity uh, that, we, that we human beings have figured out so many different ways to eat and to cook and to grow food, and we eat, eat almost anything in, in somewhere in the world. Uh, but then somewhere in the, towards the, the little close to the middle of the semester, we go into what might be called the oive section of the course, which is where you begin to worry, worry about things. And, and, uh, and so that's sort of my role here I'm, as a professional warrior to talk about supply chains, food supply chains, but particularly supply. Uh, and in, in its biggest uh, amount, uh, like, is there, is there going to be enough? And what, are, what, what kind of challenges are, which is the nice way of putting a problem or crisis, uh, the, word, the word for those things, um, opportunities that we face in trying to figure out how to have enough food in the future. So th as it was mentioned, my I wrote a book called Meals to Come, A History of the Future of Food. I'm a historian, so my first instinct when thinking about the future is to go to the past and see what people have predicted so far and see if those predictions are still relevant uh, today. And that's what my little mini talk is about. Um, but first, uh, you might say, what are, the, what, are, what are we facing in terms of the, the future? And some of the, the, the gross problems we face in, in terms of the future are our population size, uh, climate change, problems of, of oil and water, and each of those could take uh, a course in themselves. Um, and the expectation that, de that, that the demand for food is increasing while the amount of land to grow it in it may be decreasing. Um, and particularly, uh, this, the, the next one, growing demand for meat and dairy products. Um, those are very energy and resource intensive products. And as people become more <laughs> affluent, they tend to move up the food chain to more complex foods of not only meat and, and um, cheese and eggs, but also wine and beer and, uh, and, and, and convenience foods, processed foods, foods that have a lot of energy to, that, that goes into producing them. Um, at the same time, we, we waste so much food 
uh, what do we do? How do we, we, you know, there's so much that we throw away at the statistic there. I'm just pulling that from, I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I put it up there. And then the overall paradox that we face of, of, of at the same time, we, we have a, a, a billion or so people. Uh, uh, Professor Foster can talk more authoritatively about how many people are, are hungry. But um, we have a whole mass of people who are, are, don't get enough food, and then other people who are eating in, you know, not, not good food that's not necessarily good for them and getting fatter. Um, so I, I, I'm going to boil it down to uh, my, the basic question that, that, I, that drove me to, to get into the subject is, will we starve? Um, and I, that actually came out in a way out of uh, having taught food for quite a long time, and people often saying, that must be fun uh, to teach food. And I, I don't know, if you're familiar with academics, to teach something that's fun, it can be a kiss of death. Uh, and uh, so I said, all right, in this next project, I'm going to deal with something they can't say is just fun. You know, it's starvation. Are we going to run out? And, it, and if, if, if we are dealing with that, how are we going to provide enough food for the future? Um, uh, in other words, what will be the supply chain, you might say? Or how will we get more food, given all those problems that I just talked about a, a second ago? So my starting point here is a, is a book that, that appeared in 19, 18, 1798 by Thomas Malthus. Has anybody read it? It's on, it's on population. It's one of the classics. It, it actually reads quite well. It's as if... Uh, Jane Austen were an economist, basically. It's kind of very, uh, very elegantly phrased, but it's, a, it's an argument about uh, the problems of growing population and people out eating the food with the food supply, basically. And, 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 and it has this wonderful title. Um, it says, an essay on the principle of population as it affects the future improvement of society with remarks on the speculations of Mr. Godwin Monsieur Condorcet and other writers. They, they, they liked long titles back then. <laughs> and, uh, and that actually, it, the book is really a debate among free schools of thought about the future uh, and about how we feed uh, a hungry world. So three schools of thought about the future. Um, one is the name after uh, Thomas Malthus. Uh, it might be called the fewer forks position. In other words, the solution to the future is either we cut we have fewer people at the table, basically. And this, 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 this phrasing, by the way, comes from a demographer, Joel Cohen. And I, want, I always thank him, because I, I, didn't, I didn't make up the, uh, the, the, the shorthand for, for this, these concepts. But basically, we have to either cut back on population through, in order to prevent starvation through birth control, which would have been a sin in the days of Malthus, or uh, we let nature do it. And how does nature do it? through famine, through disease, through death, basically uh, pruning back uh, populations. And it's very interesting, a lot of the Malthusians were et etymologists, uh, specialists in insect populations, because you see that in insect world all the time. Why not in the human world mm -hmm. as well? And you might call that the natural fix. We'll let nature take care of it, and we'll, and we'll cut back the population. The second position is the one voiced by the Monsieur, uh, Monsieur de Condorcet, an uh, Enlightenment philosopher and science, scientist and, and mathematician. And basically, the idea is that you know, with the proper incentives, we humans will, will figure out ways to bake bigger pies. We can just grow more food. And, and again, it's a mixture of economics. If there's a demand for it, we'll figure out ways to improve this farming, and we'll figure out the ways to improve uh, the, you know, the food supply chain. Uh, and my shorthand technological fix, I call that. And then there's the third school, which isn't quite as dominant as, as the other two. And that's the, my, what I call the egalitarian school, voiced by, by William Godwin, a utopian uh, thinker of, the, of that period. That basically, no, what we really need is people to behave better, to share food. There's plenty, there can be plenty of food out there. But if we just figure out ways to distribute it more equitably, and we, we're not quite as greedy, greedy and we, we make, uh, we, we, I'll, I'll spell this out in greater detail in a minute. Um, but I, I call this the anthropological fix, basically fixing humans to be better people than they actually uh, often behave. So I want to talk about each of these, these three positions uh, a bit. And the, the Malthusian one, which is often represented in terms of victims of famines, as in the Irish famine and the 
at various African famines. It's a world of overpopulation, of famine as the natural fix. Uh, and then for those who survive, rather bad food left over for those of us who do make it. The neo-Malthusian argument t talks in terms of the Earth having a limited capacity uh, to produce food. There's got to be a certain point where it's just so many people the Earth can support, and, and usually according to the Malthusian alarmists that we hear, we're there. Uh, we're running out, and we just can't expand the food supply anymore. And I've given you a couple of graphics to, to give that suggestion of that the Earth is just too crowded and tired and just can't. And at some point, you get diminishing returns. And, uh, and, and, and we begin to starve. The Malthusian diet, to, and, and Malthus himself talks about this, is those of us who are going to survive are going to be living a rather bare bones existence on food, uh, on, on food maybe made from wood pulp and, and cellulose and algae. Uh, we'll be eating a lot of rice like the Asians. And, 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 Mal and in Malthus's day, Asia, Asia was the basket case of famine and hunger. And I guess we still think of that way, way, although a lot of that has shifted to Africa now in terms of the basket case. Uh, and the picture on the right is actually uh, seaweed fishermen in Korea, that in the, uh, in the future, if we go to an Asian diet of scarcity, we're going to be eating a lot of seaweed and kelp. And, uh, and, and actually, that does apply in Europe as well, some of the, the famine parts of uh, Famine in, uh, inflected uh, parts of, uh, of Europe uh, eat a lot of kelp, did eat a lot of kelp, uh, the Irish particularly and the, and the Scots. But the, 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 the shorthand term for this Malthusian future diet was, was often called coolie rations, the, the, the food of, the, of the, the Asian peasant. The Malthusian future is quite popular in science fiction. It's, it, it really films really well. And we've had some very good, uh, I don't know how good they are, but some vivid representations of Malthusian, the Malthusian future. What I grew up with, uh, f films like Silent Running, which is a film where the, the Earth is overcrowded and they have to, they have to uh, grow food in outer space. Or even better, Soil and Green, where the world population is um, is actually, they thought it was pretty alarming. The world has actually got 7 billion people in it. And, uh, uh, and, but New York has 35 million, and they're living in the streets and in closets and uh, in hallways. And, and uh, ultimately, what happens in Soil and Green, we discover that they're re reduced to eating recycled people. Uh, very, very, uh, Soil and Green is people, as, uh, what's his name? Who, uh, Charlton Heston, right, exactly. Thank you. You're listening. Now, the second school of thought, and this is really the default position of, of Western and modern civilization, really, is the idea, no, if, you, if, you, if there's a shortage, uh, people will figure out ways to bake bigger pies. And, we can, and the, the cornucopian future is one of better meals for less. Uh, and that's basically what, what's happened. Uh, this is where we are. Or have been, and uh, the picture on the right. I, this is, I guess I, when I, I put that together uh, uh, in, in the 2008 election, and there's John McCain serving <laughs> up a bigger pie. But it could easily be Barack Obama. You cannot get elected anywhere preaching. Oh, no, it's good if food prices go up and we and we eat less. Uh, that's it's not a winning position uh, for politicians uh, anywhere. There are two, two branches to the cornucopian future. One is the, the classic one of that if you don't have enough land, you take somebody else's. You, you move, and in the US, that was the moving west. Of course, the US was moving west from, from Europe. Um, but basically, by expanding the amount of territory, you acquire resources and, and, and animals and land uh, from other people, and then you, you eat their food. And that's the story of America in many ways. <coughs> Um, some elements of that is not only do you expand your, your, your land base, but you, you aggressively engage in, in, in sea commerce in, in ways that make deals with, with other countries that they can't refuse. Um, and you pump up the, 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 all of this with a heavy dose of nationalism. And this is pretty much the story of America in the 19th century and, and, and many of the European empires as well. Uh, the story of the West is basically an, a story of expansion to, to places where we can run more cattle. 
Um, and that actually, we inherited that from the British, because uh, the British did that first in Scotland and in Ireland, and then they moved their cattle over here, and, and the Spanish did the same thing. And it was a, basically overrun the lands of the indigenous populations with cows. Uh, that's also the story of, of uh, empire. And the, the picture in the middle, well, there's John Wayne from Red River on the left, uh, that whole cowboy, you know, thank God for the cowboys. They basically fed us for a very long time. Um, the picture in the, in the center is, a Scot, is in Scotland and Edinburgh, also celebrating the cow as kind of the, the, the primary animal of, of the British Empire. Uh, and then the picture on the right is uh, from the Albert Memorial in London. And there's a picture of Britannia with a big cow over her shoulder. I found that a very representational of really what so much of British and, and, and American as well uh, imperial policy was about, figuring out ways to get more beef by running at some the cows somewhere else. But then there's always the problem, as, as Frederick Jackson Turner pointed out in 17, 1893, um, that when there's no more land, eventually you, you go up against borders and, and there's no way to expand territory, what do you do then? Well, then you move to technology and you intensify agriculture and, and all the other elements of the food chain to make it more efficient, to, to make it more modern. Uh, stream And some of the words I've thrown in there to, to represent this kind of modernist position is um, streamlining, reducing everything to bare elements and, and growing food just for, for, you know, as corn, for instance, as corn which can be turned into everything. Animals, it can be turned into fuel, it can be turned into uh, so many different products, as Michael Pollan has said. Uh, exploring synthetic foods and, uh, and also making production more efficient, mainly by consolidating it and making it more Fordist. Fordist meaning the idea of, of breaking down uh, labor into, into various parts and figuring out ways to produce things more, more quickly and, and, and cheaply that way. And, and it, you don't have to go very much farther than Chipotle to see that in, in action. It's just amazing seeing how a burrito gets assembled so quickly and inexpensively at Chipotle. It's perfect Fordism. We've, we've done this in, in other ways, too, uh, through the i give you a couple examples of industrial farming. We've been doing this for quite a long time, at least since the late 19th century, uh, in t intensifying production through mechanization and ever larger farms, uh, as, such as that lettuce farm in California in, in the 1930s, or this uh, feedlot in Nebraska in the 1990s. Uh, in science fiction, they've kind of taken it one step further and envisioned uh, a future of, of uh, one all-in-one production. Um, where everything is, is, all the different phases of growing and processing and transporting are all done in the same place. And this, this, this is some concept of the farm of the future in, 17, in 1970. Um, or also finding out ways to grow food in places that never had grown food before, such as the desert. What I find interesting about this desert farm image from the 1960s is that there's no people in it. It's all very automated. Push button, this is the push button future. It almost looks like an airport being run by controllers or sitting at their desk, and that's the farmer of the future, of the modernist future. Um, and also, uh, as I said, the, uh, syn the idea of synthetic foods, which is an almost endless frontier of, of other kinds of foods that can be concocted. Uh, the meal and the pill idea for many years was, was posed as, well, if, if we just run out of cows and run out of wheat, we can always eat pills which can be concocted from chemicals uh, very cheaply. Uh, and the picture on the left is from a 1931 film, uh, Just Imagine, which, uh, in, in, in which a guy from the, the, the 1920s comes to, goes to the future and, and he goes to a, a, an automat where he gets his dinner uh, from, in pills and he's talking to the two guys on the, around him about how he says, hmm, kind of tasty but a bit chewy. It's, it's supposedly a roast beef dinner in a pill. Uh, and NASA went somewhat in this direction, not to the extent of pills, but with other kinds of space foods, such as the space tube, the uh, food in the tube that you see on the right, uh, which John Glenn was subjected to when he went around the Earth in the, in the early 60s. Uh, the astronauts, needless to say, didn't really much like this food, and they didn't eat it very much. And uh, they always came back having lost a lot of weight, having, having eaten NASA's space food. But then anyway, the concept was that this is really where we can all go if, if you know, and so much for Malthus. 
Um, now, as I, I put that up there last because uh, there was clearly a reaction against uh, industrial modernization, particularly beginning in the 1960s, uh, and I, and the notion that really it's very inhuman and, and, and it might be creating foods that will get out of control. And you hear this kind of rhetoric, particularly dealing with biotechnology today. So the attack of the killer tomatoes from the early 70s was really anticipating a lot of the concerns today about frankenfoods and foods that are just too monstrous to, for us to, to eat as human beings. So the danger of modernism, it can always go a bit too far. So then I, then I want to wind up with the last, um, the last school of thought, which is the one that, I, that got me into food in the first place. And that's the, the William Godwin. William Godwin was this utopian thinker uh, husband of Mary Wollstonecraft, who was probably the, one of the great early feminists of the, uh, and also the father of Mary, she Mary Shelley, uh, Mary Godwin, uh, who also wrote about Frankenstein, the, the Frankenstein monster. He was a very powerful family uh, in, in shaping ideas about the future. But Godwin also basically argued that we could eat, we could have enough food if we share it. And I, and I throw out better. We, we, we distribute it more equitably. Um, we decentralize food production, bring um, farmers, producers, and, and consumers closer together in a, in a relationship of, of respect. Um, you free up women, give them, uh, women grow a huge amount of food in the world to this day, uh, but they don't necessarily have ownership over it, and if women are given equality or, or, or get equality, um, they, will, they will be able to grow more food uh, and feed their families, particularly in third world countries that we all need to cooperate ways, you know, cut, get the profit out of food uh, and make it more of a cooperative effort. Um, we, and we just really need to eat less too, uh, the ascetic quality, not be quite so greedy. And, 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 and finally, slow down. That's the, uh, we slow down and eat slow, more slowly and we just slow down our lives. We won't be as, uh, we won't eat A, as much and we we'll also won't rely as much on convenience foods which, um, require quite a lot of energy and to, to, to make. Um, the picture on the right, actually, uh, in light of the uh, Oscars, I thought, well, that's really mm -hmm. Les Miserables. Or, but that is actually Les Miserables. That's uh, the, the revolution of, 19, of 1848 in Germany. So the, it's kind of a revolutionary ethic in, in the notion of uh, uh, the anthropological fix, because you're really very idealistic about you want to put, push humans in a direction they've really never gone before and being much more altruistic. A lot of utopian novels written about that kind of future. Godwin's book himself, Political Justice, which was, not, was a, a political analysis rather than a, a utopian novel, it lays out a lot of the theories. Uh, there were a lot of utopian novels in the 19th and 20th centuries that sort of suggested what this world might look like of cooperative, ascetic, feminist, ecologically minded. Uh, people. The one on the right is uh, William Morris's News from Nowhere in which Britain goes back to kind of a medieval socialism and the, the Houses of Parliament become places for growing compost and, and everyone eats whole grain farm bread and, uh, and, and everybody's treated very equitably and, and it's great, great fun. Um, in the 1960s brought some of this thinking back and I went through it myself. The picture on the left there is, is my wife and I in our community garden in 1972 in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, and I must say that I re the, the concept of growing your own food had, a, had quite a political, um, a political connection to it. Uh, and I really experienced that more when I came to Washington in 1974. And uh, we, we grew eggplants and tomatoes on our front lawn in Capitol Hill. And seeing the reaction of so many of the neighbors to growing vegetables in your front yard, they were really shocked. And I really think was, that even just the act of growing your own food could be very upsetting to the, and, and our landlord worked for the CIA, so we really enjoyed subverting him through our tomatoes. Um, and then years later, I wrote a book on, this, on how the counterculture sort of took on the food industry and, and, and sort of set in motion the, the, the good food movement of, of, of today. I called it Appetite for Change, how the counterculture took on the food industry. So I, I've, I've done quite a lot of thinking about this. 
Um, and, and in more recent years, I realized that there are deeper roots to this idea, of Godwin, but also back to um, uh, local foods. Let me get me here. Let me get there. The idea of decentralizing food uh, and, and, and A, using less resources because of it, theoretically, but also uh, creating a more um, caring food system where producers and the farmers, uh, producers and consumers actually know each other and treat each other with respect and, and, uh, and, and, and farmers get the right price for their food and, and you the consumer being altruistic and, uh, and egalitarian are willing to pay a little more to your, to your farmers so that they, they can make a living. Um, there are roots of this in the, uh, in the world. How do you get people to be this way? And that's really this is where I'm going to end up right now. How do you get people? How do you make fix people anthropologically to, so that they behave more nobly than they ever they normally do? Well, one example for that is is during war, wartime. In both world wars, uh, there were there were concerted efforts to try to make people act more equitably and, and be less greedy. Uh, the Victory Gardens of both world wars uh, had a lot of this element of growing your own, saving resources, uh, appreciating food more, uh, growing healthier foods in your own gardens. Um, and then also in the war, both wars there were attempts to try to get people to eat less or eat foods that were lower down the food chain, uh, closer to the land and less, less energy intensive. Uh, the, the, both of these posters come from, from attempts during uh, World War I. Uh, by the Food Administration, the one on the left trying to get people to eat more grains and, and less uh, of the more expensive foods like wheat and, and, sh and, and meat and, and sugar and fat, the idea being that then that food was freed up to, 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 to uh, feed our army as well as the starving in Europe, the starving Belgians. And then the idea of the clean plate was addressing the, the whole question of waste, that we throw away so much food. And, and the, the clean plate doctrine appears during World War I as well, saying uh, the best way to fight the enemy is not to waste food. And meanwhile, you'd be able to feed a lot more of the starving, again, the starving Belgians and the starving Armenians of, of, of the old world. Um, so there is precedent for this kind of altruism. And the question is, how do you bring that kind of wartime urgency to peacetime? That's where it usually falls apart. You have to have a sense of real urgency. Now, I have a couple of general questions to throw out, and then I'm done, uh, at least for this moment. Do we really want to go back and be, have a world of fa small farmers? Uh, does, how many people really want to do that kind of life? Uh, and and keeping in mind that it's always been a really tough way to, to, to make a living, and all these farmers came to the city for some reason, historically, <laughs> Uh, because agriculture couldn't support them. But also the quality of life. This, this, this image that I use is actually from a, uh, a, um, uh, a, a, a poster called American Scream that puts together two iconic uh, pictures. One, Edvard Munch's uh, The Scream on the left, and then Grant Wood's uh, American Gothic on the right, and the, while the, the, the male seems rather happy with his, or at least stoic about his world life as a farmer, the woman is in a state of hysteria. And I use that as a, as a depiction of what farm life was like for women. Uh, it, was, it was kind of, a lot of women were driven absolutely mad by living on farms. It was a very lonely, isolated life, and a life uh, of great hardship. And so we, we have to really think twice about what kind of lifestyle are we, are we talking about when we want to go back to it? Another element that has to be questioned, and historians like to do this a lot, is uh, the nostalgia for the way people used to cook, uh, home cooking, the cult of home cooking, which is part of the element that, of, of the egalitarian ideas that you have to do, do more of this yourself, more cooking yourself, and the food is better anyway. Uh, for you than eating at uh, McDonald's or you know out of out of the food system, uh, but you know was Grandma really a better cook? And we don't really know that people were better cooks. Uh, there was a lot of lot of language and a lot of literature out there describing really terrible meals in the, when Mom was cooking and Grandma was cooking, and uh, a lot of burnt dinners. Um, and, and for a very long time, the modern food, convenience food system was really a way of seeing, seen as a way of liberating women uh, rather than uh, 
uh, enslaving us. Um, and, and a lot of convenience foods were, were welcomed wholeheartedly by our grandma, including things like Jell-O back in the 1920s. Um, so we really need to be careful about what, what kind of food system we're, we are, we are uh, idealizing, particularly if you think that we, if it's a nostalgic kind. Um, and then finally, in my last question, well, two, I have two more questions, actually. Do we really want to give up convenience, which is sort of implied in the, in the uh, egalitarian um, model of the future, you know, eating less, less processed foods, eating lower down the, the food chain. Um, do we really want to give that up? Or are we, as the, the poster suggests, if you are what you, what you eat, then I'm fast, cheap, and easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of our food identities have been, this, have been associated with convenience, and it is the backbone of the food industry. And, it, and actually, convenience does free us up to do other things besides cook. And, uh, and we, what is the proper balance? How much convenience do you want to trade off for, uh, for, for a more virtuous uh, future? That's a, that's, a, that's a tough question we have to deal with, and maybe you want to bring that up in the discussion. And finally, my last question was, this started out as a discussion about will the world starve? Will there be enough food? And by growing our own food and cooking our, baking our own breads and, uh, and, and going to the, co the farmer's market, is that really helping Chad get more, you know, if you take that as representative of, of scarcity in, in, in Africa? Or, or how does that help feed China, which is, is a country emerging from great poverty, but now where the people that really want to eat higher up on the food chain want to eat more meat and, and processed foods and, and beer? Uh, what, what does that do for them? And, um, and that's going to be my handoff here to Dr. Foster. How many of y'all like Jell-O? Everyone? Do you know when we had terrible floods down the Mississippi, the price of Jell-O and gelatin went way up? You know why that happened? Yeah. Well, actually, it's pigs, but yeah. The pig skins from which Jell-O is made became much more expensive. Do you know what Jell-O is made of? Or the pills you take with gelatin? It's quite interesting, isn't it? That's part of what I'll be talking about today in the second half, which is provenance. The first half is more directly related to what Professor Valesco just said. For the poor, the future is now. Will we starve? Will our kids starve? Can we feed our kids? Food and poverty are really strongly linked. And so the first part of the discussion will be on that, following up from the words that we just said. They're related by definition, because most concepts of poverty are based on food. And they're also related through the policies that are now breaking the cycle of poverty. The second part will discuss the future of food and the factors that might influence the future of food, supply factors, demand factors. I'm going to focus entirely on demand factors. There's a notion in economics, and I'm an economist, of consumer sovereignty that what you guys want, you get. <coughs> and so you are the agents of change. There's a special role of information of a particular type that will help you, just like that Jell-O discussion, in your choices. And it's a type of information called provenance. It's a French word. It links products to their creation and also involves moral as well as economic considerations. OK? So let me give you a little history. And this is way back when Charles Booth, who was a businessman, was hanging around and said, uh, was picked up a pamphlet and saw that it said that, my goodness, 25% of the people in London are not earning a living wage. This can't be right. And so he dedicated the next 17 years to disproving this and wound up writing 17 volumes. But by the time 1889 came around, he had already concluded that 35% of the people in London were, in fact, abjectly poor. He was the originator of the idea, or at least in the modern history, of a poverty line. But it was Sebaum Rontree who created the first scientific poverty line based on a diet. He called it a dietary. 
And if you look up there, you can see the kinds of diets he had created for the average person in York, England. And it has on the left side bread, margarine, tea for breakfast, for boiled beans, peas pudding. What's peas pudding, by the way? Peas porch hot, peas porch cold. Anyone know? The word we call it now is pea. Peas is the original word. word. It was a singular. But because we thought it meant plural, in the late 1700s, it became pea. Isn't that interesting? Same thing happened to cherries. It was cherries for singular and became cherry as a matter of a mistake. So on the right-hand side, we see bread, margarine, and cocoa for supper. Cocoa for supper? A pint of cocoa. I've always marveled at that ever since I wrote my first paper on poverty in the 1980s. And well, it isn't that unusual, and I'll explain why. But his conclusion was that 28% of the people in York were poor. They couldn't even afford this basic dietary. And he updated his results in 1935 and 51, essentially raising the quality of the dietary and the other things that went along with his description of a scientific poverty line. Quite responsible for the social policy in England, actually. But if you look at Coco, let's return to what he did. He was, in fact, the uh, owner of a business in York, which was the chocolate business. Uh, being a good Quaker, uh, went into Coco and released this 1887 uh, drink called Round Trees Elect Coco. What was it marketed as? Food. Why do we have it here? It was food of the time. You might also remember Roundtree of uh, York as being the company that introduced Kit Kat. Later became very popular in many parts of the world and also here. Uh, by the way, this Roundtree's was an unusual company because it was founded by a woman, Mary Tuke, in the 1700s. Later became Roundtree's of York. So we come on to about 1963 when we start seeing poverty as being conceived of as a minimum basket of goods that the USDA said was necessary. If you read it, it says temporary or emergency use when funds are loan, low only. That's what this bundle was supposed to be used for. In 63, it was priced out to see what it took to achieve that. That was the poverty line. No, not quite, because you have to buy other things besides food. And so Molly Orshansky, who was designing this, realized that only a third of income was generally spent on food, therefore multiplied by three that basic amount to get the poverty line, and that's the poverty line we have today. Has not changed. So, oh, inflation, of course, inflation is included. But apart from inflation, no change. So if we have 15% poor right now, or 16, it's at that standard that was concocted back in the 1960s. The line is about $16 a day per person. The World Bank put together an international poverty line at a much lower level, 125, to evaluate poverty across the world. And the results, as you can see, have been amazing. Look at the lowering of the number of people who are poor by this definition, from 2 billion to 1.5 billion, primarily due to China, which has had tremendous increase in, uh, in income. India is following along, Sub-Saharan Africa is having some troubles. But all countries now are lowering in terms of percentage, not all countries, but all regions are lowering in terms of percentage of people who are poor. But there is quite a disconnect between this 125 a day and the notion of what it takes to survive, if not well. Look at India, has had a tremendous growth of income. But in fact, the number of kids who are malnourished has stayed around constant and around 45, 46% of all kids in India, not captured by the $1.25 a day standard. In other words, there's a huge disconnect between the way poverty is measured here and the way we might evaluate, you know, think of what poverty means, which is the reason why I and a couple of friends, one at Oxford, Sabina Alkire, put together another way of looking at poverty. It's called the Multidimensional Poverty Index. And you can see its very definition on the right side. It includes nutrition, which is really a, a seen nutrition in kids, the weight as per their age, 
a kid is considered malnourished if they're below st two standard deviations from the median of some standard worldwide. So that's included in the very definition of poverty here, as well as other dimensions related to food. This is a much more holistic measure incorporating education and other things. And where are the poor by this definition? South Asia and Africa. Uh, you can see the results in the human development reports every year it comes out. In fact, they're just releasing the new results. My, my colleague just told me she, she completed them. All right, so let's go back to the discussion that we had before. It really is, in many ways, all a matter of distribution. Where is the population growth? The population growth is highly unequally distributed across the world. And I'll go to the next slide here and see if I can click it so that it moves very cleverly. Ha ha. You have it done not very cleverly here. <laughs> click, click. There we go again. Click. And of course, click. And of course, click. <laughs> I'm actually a Mac person, so this means the Mac is not happy. Thank you. And I'm going to click back and forth to this. I hope you follow with me. Notice the, where the growth is taking place. Primarily Africa. Other regions to some extent, but this is the number of kids per women, per woman in these regions. Europe, of course, is contracting. Africa is growing still quite steadily and fast. And the other regions are slowing down in their growth. So where will the populations be occurring in terms of their change? It'll be changing in Africa and parts of South Asia primarily. And this is reflected in the projection. All this is from The Economist uh, with African countries such as Nigeria, that's a straight line almost straight up, uh, Tanz Tanzania. Uh, United States is actually growing there. Over on the right-hand side, China way down with the one-child policy, and India peaking at uh, 2050 and then dropping down to 20, uh, 2100. Okay? So it will be unequally distributed where the population is. Secondly, who needs these technologies? Who needs the new technologies? Actually, Africa needs the new technologies. It hasn't had its green revolution. So who's doing anything to help that? Well, there's USAID and the Feed the Future initiative, uh, which is much broader than actually USAID. There's a new measure called the Women's Empowerment in Agriculture Index, which tries to understand just what you were saying, how to get women involved in agriculture over there by evaluating if they feel empowered to do so. If they're empowered and they receive the new technology, they might do something about it. If they're not empowered, you can throw all the technology you want and you'll go nowhere. So this index is built on exactly the same structure as the poverty index you just saw. So it's put together on an Alcair Foster approach. Also, M-Pesa, which means mobile money in Swahili, has been allowing individual farmers to buy their own insurance, crop insurance, and therefore take the chance to actually go out and uh, use a new technology. This is where technology transfer can occur if people are somewhat safe from the mistakes that might occur due to bad weather. Equality of what? I would claim that equality of food comes through equality of other things. So in particular, investments in capabilities. The underlying concept here is all those things that you value and that help you become who you are, help you be who you are, they would like that too. And so one of the key investments, of course, is education. So we'll talk a little bit about some neat new programs on that before we move to Providence. So what's being done? Altering the future via policies. Investments in education and development. Actually, Joel Cohen goes on to discuss in, in many other places the importance of education. In fact, went on to study it after he had talked about some of the issues we talked about today. And the importance of secondary education. Uh, Jim Heckman, Nobel Prize winner in economics, has gone on to discuss issues related to kids at a very early age and how it forms everything for their entire life thereafter and is trying to influence subsequent IQ. Yes, it can be changed and subsequent earnings as a result of investments at a very early age. And he quoted for a recent article just a few days ago with NPR, uh, the greatest capital that you invest in is human capital. And of that, the most important component is the mother. This is Alfred Marshall, long time ago, the father of why we have prices here and quantities here. 
as opposed to the other way around, which is what they should be if you were a mathematician. Now, other projects that are out there that have been really interestingly successful and have combined elements of food, nutrition, education, and health have been the Progresa and Opportunities Pro Opportunidades program in Mexico. Uh, what that is designed to do is to provide a small, tiny incentive for a family to make sure their kids stay in school, to make sure they go visit the doctor, and to make sure they get enough nutrition. And the impact has been rather strong and has been independently attested a lot of times. Uh, really outcome, a great outcome for educational impacts as well as nutritional, taller kids, et cetera, et cetera. Head Start, our local program for the poor here. It's an investment in kids early on to make sure that they are ready for school, but also that they're ready for life. And there have been incredible <coughs> outcomes that have been documented, others that haven't been. In other words, that they haven't been able to find the cognitive effects as much as other sort of non-cognitive impacts of what Head Start does. School lunch programs, of course, have been very successful in keeping kids in school and also in giving them nutrition with which to study. Now, the future holds potential of big price spikes. And here we have a picture of what has happened in the last few years. And we can see that international prices for food of different types, we have beverages, food grains, fat and oils, these are internationally trade substances, have spiked up tremendously a few years back and are spiking up now as well. The big drivers, of course, are the discussion in India and China. As they become richer and richer, they want more. Biofuels, this is another big place that food is being siphoned off into energy. And then finally, just the whole idea of globalization. But what's interesting about globalization is that when they refigured the numbers to see the impact on the real poor, the real hungry, it wasn't there from these spikes. And the reason the FAO said it wasn't there was that there was a lot of local food compensation. So that local foods took the place of the other foods that had been coming in. And so they took back all the assumptions that led them to a billion who were hungry to somewhere around 800 million. Quite interesting. But the data on hungry, hunger around the world isn't that great. It just isn't there. That's why I focus in this discussion on poverty. Another interesting example, of course, is quinoa, which is from the UN, this is the International Year of Quinoa. Isn't that great? Quinoa is a local grain, old grain, uh, or near grain, as it were. But what's interesting is that you're probably eating it now. I know I am. Now, were we eating it 10 years ago? Probably not. And the Bolivian and other people were eating it. The question is, what does this do to the price of quinoa for the local people? <laughs> so that's been one of the issues. It's helped if you are a seller of quinoa, the higher price is a great thing. Yes, if you are a net buyer of quinoa, it hurts you. So there's a double-edged sword here. Future, and this is the discussions of Sen's entitlement approach to famines, a really fabulous discussion that he started uh, probably about 20, 30 years ago. The entitlement approach, most famines, all famines, in fact, according to his documentation, is they're not anything to do, or should I say, they're not consistently related to supply. Supply may have a shock, but then look at the figures in the upper right-hand side of the very important Bengal, Bengal famine during the war, and you see the food was there. It was being produced. It's just the people who needed it were not entitled to it, meaning they couldn't buy it. Well, what happened to prices? The price of labor went through the ground. The price of food went through the roof. They could not buy food. Now, of course, this was in wartime, so maybe there was some direction by the British. We'll see. But the point is that that's what's going on even to this day. It's a distributional issue. Secondly, no democracy has experienced famine. And this was an interesting discussion because it pointed out how important information can be in activating people, particularly through media. So let me talk a little bit about another way that information can activate people. And it's given the name by me, Providence. It gives customers the power to do good in the world. So addressing the discussion that we had seen before. So what makes us buy stuff? Marketers say that it's 
four Ps, or at least they used to. Product, the characteristics of the product. Price, promotion, that means their advertising and so forth. And then place, how convenient is it to buy it? Well, economists would add something a little bit more to that. They'd probably say preferences and values make some difference. So you focus on the consumer for a bit. And I give you a picture of one of our famous economists here, Ben Stein. Mm -hmm. Ben Stein is a local guy. You may recognize him from Ferris Bueller right there. Uh, he used to sit in the back of the room. He was actually quite a strong Latin student. And when the, the student, the teacher, and this is given to me by Tony uh, uh, Yezer, who's one of our faculty members, uh, he told me this today, that when the uh, teacher would try and talk in Latin, Ben Stein would crack up and make cracks from the back. So quite an interesting local discussion. Uh, consumer sovereignty is what economists are all about. The consumers have the power to choose what is produced, ultimately. Is that really the case? Well, you need to have key ingredients to make the right decision. You need to have all the relevant information on products. Previously, there was a focus only on material aspects. And so decisions were made on material aspects. But there's all kinds of new consumer sovereignty that I'm seeing across a lot of people, including my daughter, who surprised me last year by deciding to take off from college and spend a term on an organic farm. So I realized this was real when she did that. Had the time of her life, it was tough as hell. She worked harder than she's ever done before, but came back saying it was the best experience and she would like to go there next year and take her sister. I think that that's a compliment. I think it's a positive statement. So these new forms of consumer sovereignty, the new types of moral provenance issues include labor conditions under which things are produced, the carbon footprint of the item, whether it comes from a conflict zone, like a diamond that could be tainted from that. Sustainability in general. Was there a fair price paid to farmers for the good? Is it locally grown? I see them all, all the time now cropping up in discussions of what are the decisions that people are using to purchase products. Now, how can you be sure that what you think that, prop, that product has in it, okay, in the form of its history, where it was produced, how it was produced, and so on, is actually there. That's where the term provenance comes in. Before I define things, let me give you some examples. Here are a couple of drawings. Do they have the same value, or do they have different values? One of them is just a drawing by itself. It has Picasso in the upper right, left-hand side. And the other one has papers authenticating the artist and the chain of ownership since it was produced. Which one has more value? Actually, it's a lie. They're both from eBay. And they're priced at about 55 right now. So I guess they're not Picasso. But for illustrative purposes, take a look at this one. So there's two Stratocaster 1968 guitars, backwards because some left-hander was playing it. Now the one on the left comes as is. The one on the right comes with an authentication that says Jimi Hendrix owned it and outlines who owned it ever since then. The one on the left is about worth uh, five, seven thousand, let's say. Yeah, 1968 Stratocaster is a big thing. The one on the right, 168,000 in 2006 it went for. So in other words, maybe that piece of paper, that discussion of provenance, that where it came from is important. Two more examples that might be more relevant for the course at hand. Two eggs. What would you pay for 12 of these? One on the left is a cage raised. Perhaps, maybe not. Maybe it's a great egg. Who knows? The one on the right comes with an authentic statement, which has information on Farmer Sutton, who raised it locally. And he did so letting chickens run in the range and also through a process that led to an organic <coughs> certification. Which would you pay more for? 20 years ago, no difference as far as I could tell. Nowadays, quite a big difference. There are probably 10 varieties of eggs in most European uh, supermarkets. All right, final example, which would you pay more for? Or should I say, which do you pay more for? Because you undoubtedly do pay for the one on the right. 
which has some kind of authenticity that describes that the coffee was, let's say, single <coughs> farmer sourced, grown organically and under fair trade conditions. And you can add to that an endless list of discussion. So what is it that gives all the ones on the right their value? It's the authenticity that's presented by some independent documentation. Provenance means to come from. It's valuable information on the history of a product which creates a link between people to people, people to product, and so on. And I first started talking about this when I uh, read a book by my uh, co-author, a guy named Ted Fisher at uh, Vanderbilt, called Broccoli and Desire. He's talking about the broccoli, uh, people who buy broccoli in Nashville and the people who raise broccoli in Guatemala and how they're connected through the chain. It was a fascinating discussion. And then we went on to write a Mimeo that we've never upgraded and published. As usual, it takes me about 10 years to write and finish something. The information, unfortunately, is not easily available from physical product itself in most cases, the things we've been talking about. Sometimes it is. But the kinds of provenance information you have to get from somewhere else. Example includes terroir, which is a real designation that this came from a location and therefore is in, has within it certain qualities that you may not be able to actually taste, feel, test for, but which are there because of the location. I put down uh, Jose Andres' name because he himself creates value because of what he stands for. And therefore, we go to one of his restaurants, we know what to expect. Even though the details aren't there, we get the big picture as to what the guidelines are. So a brand name that has established a great reputation is an example. Nike has had its problems in the past with production processes and has tried dramatically to change that perception because it impacts the bottom line. Locally sourced, I mentioned before. Anti-examples. I think an examples where bad provenance is there is really fascinating. For example, vague supply chains and provenance laundering where you actually ignore who you got it from. I don't know, it could be this supplier, that supplier. And this we see with the melamine uh, disaster in China where this substance was put into milk, I guess to make it look like it had more protein or something in it, and it led to all sorts of problems for all sorts of people, but you couldn't tell. Mortgages in 2006, anyone around at that time? The reason for the financial disaster is really that many people went out, got mortgages, that were enticed to get mortgages through people that made money when they get, got mortgages. And it so happened that the provenance of the mortgages was never recovered. It was laundered through the system and put into bonds that were then sold and given AAA ratings. So provenance is behind the disaster that we had before. Horse meat hamburgers, tilapia for snapper, should I go on? Implication, this is Economics, I'll do a quick analysis. Suppose you have two products, one which uses more fuel to produce, another which uses less. A is the one that uses more, it has a bigger carbon footprint. B uses less, it's done with a more sustainable approach of production. In scenario one, there's no provenance information. You don't know which is which when it hits the marketplace. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to buy the cheapest product. Who wins? The producer of A. It drives B out of the marketplace. And this is a result of George Akerlof's famous Lemons model in economics. George will be here on Wednesday, by the way, uh, giving a talk in the economics department. Drive it right out of the marketplace, as you can imagine. However, if information is provided combined with consumers that are motivated, that care about it, then you can see a separating equilibrium where a price for B is actually higher and is acceptable because you have documented proof that this has been produced in the appropriate way. A, on the other hand, is dismissed and effect effectively pushed out of the marketplace over time. What happens then is there's an internalization of all these negative things that were going into the world, into the air and priced out within the marketplace so the market can actually work. This is the idea behind provenance. Now, who can provide this information? Why, well, firms themselves do it all the time. Go online to McDonald's and you'll see a fabulous discussion of how little energy they actually use. This was brought to my attention actually by Jose Andres, who said, oh, the amount of energy I use. 
Firms themselves can provide this information. However, is it marketing or is it authentic? Hence the need for outside people. Independent organizations, as with fair trade and so forth. Governments can extend labeling re regulations to include labels online. So you can list more of the information right there and can prevent the kinds of rules that stop people from including things that would be relevant to consumers appearing on labels, such as the source of the product. It might be useful for many people to know source. Who can provide provenance information? I'll get to the final person. That's consumers. Consumers who are empowered by the web, and there's a QR code over to the right-hand side. They now can take your little handheld, scan the code, out pops a website saying where everything came from. It could either be provided by the producer or by an independent agency. This is spelling the new uh, world for consumers. It can also be an activated uh, consumer group linked with media who are investigating situations that seem somewhat egregious. So altogether, uh, this is a potential way of proceeding forward as to what we were talking about earlier. How can people become more egalitarian minded? Well, you need to have the system right in order for that to happen. So the challenge I have for you is as follows. Find your issues, the ones that you consider to be crucially important for your consumption, the types of products that you don't want to consume because of their provenance has not been ascertained. Okay? And then generate provenance. If it's bad or good, you'll know better as to how to choose between products. And then consume wisely based on your information. Thank you very much. Great. So we have some time for questions. Are there any? Yeah, I was wondering, in the case of the the CC, the conditional cash transfer yeah. program, um, doesn't it necessitate a lot of state strength in order to do that? Doesn't that immediately rule out a bunch of countries who don't have the capability to implement a conditional cash transfer program? The answer is yes. Okay. In other words, there, okay. the state that implemented this was Mexico. And that state had the resources to do it through the oil money. And they had the will to do it because the person who was just elected was a professor, knew what was going on, and said, we're going to do it. Other countries have followed along and have found cheaper ways of doing things. The whole point is to give the small incentive in order to get someone who would like to invest in her own kids to invest in her own kids. And right now, the person is very poor, desperately poor, and has to pay attention to what's in front of her. But with an incentive, it replaces some of the lost income from paying attention to this issue, but also focuses her to make sure the kid's in school 85% of the time, et cetera. So to the extent that you have a poorer country, it takes less. Richer country, like Mexico, it takes more. So there have been good experiments that are now showing up in other countries, but it's still a good question as to whether they're going to actually achieve the same kinds of results we've seen there and in Brazil. Thank you. But aren't there some cash transfer programs that are not conditional that lead to the same kinds of outcomes? Yes, there's been some discussion by David Hume, just give him the money. I find that to be a bit, excuse me, that's my wife. <laughs> Oh, well, maybe I'm wrong. Oh, it's the UN. <laughs> I owe them an evaluation of the Human Development Index. OK, uh, yes, conditional cash transfer. Uh, the point of the conditional cash transfer program was to induce behavior that would have long-term impacts and keep people out of future poverty, right? Because then kids would have investments in education which would hold them in good stead a generation, you know, in 20 years. The income is small. Sometimes there are good effects from giving small amounts of income to people without anything else attached. Sometimes not. The model that I think of in my head probably is a little bit better support of a conditional cash transfer pro uh, problem, but I don't know. This is an empirical question. If it does the same thing, that's interesting. You should have charged them. Yes. It's a, it's a symptom of the higher poverty. 
In fact, what's brought down the population uh, growth rate worldwide in other countries has been increased development and lower number of people in poverty. Uh, my colleague Stephen Smith, who wrote the book in development, in fact, the textbook I use, uh, notes this and, and uh, emphasizes this fact that high population is a symptom, high population growth is a symptom of kids dying. Okay, so what happens is that you have a lot of kids who die, therefore you have a lot of kids, and as you get a little bit more uh, gain in terms of health, then they don't die. So it's there's a constant mismatch, and then over time, as development occurs, as they have more income, more healthy environment, then it brings it back down to a level that is seen in other countries. So you're right. It's, uh, it's related to the poverty level within the region. The map is almost identical, the same. It's, it's, that region is very, very poor. Uh, with PEPFAR and USAID transitioning from a materials assistance to a more technical supported role overseas, how do you think that'll affect uh, things such as food assistance and poverty reduction? I don't know. I'm not a USAID wonk, so I, I really don't know. So say that in English. Uh, they're giving less food and medicine direct aid to other countries, and they're focusing more on technical and support partnerships that have country ownership. Thank you. Now we can discuss it. First of all, <laughs> direct transfer. What do you think of direct transfers of food, Professor Flesco? Do you think it's a great thing in Haiti that we send all, all sorts of cheeses and foods? No. To? I mean, the, our, usually the knock on that is that it undermines the local producers and puts them out of business. Exactly. And so therefore, there's tre tremendous dependency that arises and mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. It's the same with most acute aid, is to address a problem now. Okay? We don't want to have acute aid if there isn't, uh, if there's any way around it. We would like to have investments in people so that they can make, you know, the changes themselves. So I think that this is what you've described as perhaps a move for the better. Technical assistance, by the way, has been withdrawn from all over the world by us. I mean, we haven't been offering the kinds of, of agricultural assistance uh, over the last 10, 15 years. That's welcome. We should be out there in the field with folks. It, it only makes sense. I had a question, actually. Um, you were talking about the carrying capacity. And I wondered, have we reached it? Would we know? Is it moving target? Well, the, the uh, here I go, go with what Joel Cohen uh, wrote about this uh, and how many people can the Earth support? I mean, there is no, abs there is no objective number. It really depends on what level, uh, what, what <coughs> kind of lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you all want to live uh, at a peasant lifestyle, uh, mostly grain, based uh, diet and not a whole lot of consumption of other things, you can, you can afford a lot more people on the earth. So it's, a, it's really a question of value. You know, he, he makes the argument that it's, a, it's a, one of values of what kind of life do you want to live. I mean, and it seems as though the concept of the nutrition transi transition would suggest that as people get wealthier, they want more expensive food. Uh, and that would also reduce the carrying capacity because those, those kinds of foods take up a lot more resources. Interestingly, though, in Europe and in the U.S. now, I see a lot of movements for the lowering down the amount that's eaten, <coughs> the shifting to the more uh, sort of basic, right, as you know. Yeah, is there something beyond the nutrition transition, another phase Could where people be? then become more ascetic? Yeah. 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 I don't know. Uh, we're still pretty high consumers. I mean, you know, the, you see those statistics about how an average American consumes 30 times more than an average Indian, that kind of thing. So well, let's not be average. Hmm. <laughs> I think there was a question over there. Um, yeah. yeah, I was wondering how climate change fits into this whole discussion and how with um, deteriorating, you know, uh, ecosystems and um, you mentioned kelp as a possible resource for, um, uh, like nutrition supplementation and with like uh, the kelp forest kind of uh, going away, I was just wondering if you had any thoughts about the immediate and long-term impacts? Well, it's a huge concern, obviously, but, but I, would, I would basically say uh, the future based on, with climate change is uncertain, you know, the, and that may be the worst thing for production uh, to invest and not know uh, whether you're going to be swamp, you're going to be flooded, uh, you know, in 10 years from now, or, or burned up because of, of, of drought, 
Um, and that, so that has to have an effect. But you know, I, I, people talk about winners and losers with climate change too. I mean, there may be areas that uh, will, will become more productive. You know, on the, uh, so it, I, there is no easy answer to that. I mean, do you want to take that one up? Yes, climate change. Uh, the key there is adaptation. And so, in my institute, I have an international uh, institute in the Elliott School, uh, which covers a number of main topics. One, poverty. Another is, in fact adaptation to climate change in poor countries. Uh, I mean, the issue is, to what extent will there be adaptation at the grassroots level by people in the field to the situation that they have? And to what extent can they? And so, as I think your main point is, it's very uncertain, mm -hmm. but people know that it will be very uncertain and therefore can make plans for an uncertain future. Okay, so the M-Pesa discussion I have is in some sense like that. It's sort of making plans for an uncertain future by buying some kind of an insurance that's based on how much rain falls from the sky. It partially insures when you have a, uh, not enough rain. So to the extent that these institutions can be built up to protect, but also individuals build themselves up to protect, that will be a positive result. Otherwise, if you're stuck in Bangladesh and the water's rising, uh, what can you do? One uh, virtue that's been made of, of the whole uh, go back to cooking, back to the land, uh, going off the, the grid kind of more, more self-sufficiency in people's lives uh, is that that may be the best adaptation for the apocalypse uh, if that's what's going to happen. And you do get whole, there are pockets of people throughout the world, uh, and I have relatives who live in them, uh, uh, that are prepared for the great for Armageddon in terms of the climate uh, climate change or social revolution. And they are great cooks. I mean, they, they're really <laughs> learning. They, they, they can do anything. They can slaughter a cow. Uh, they, they know how to bake wonderful bread using air from uh, yeast from the air. I mean, they're really survivalists. It's not necessarily that's the way we want to us to go, though, but I mean, it may be kind of a consolation prize, at least. Mm -hmm. some, some people will be able to survive. Well, that is one argument for it, and I think also it, 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 we're freed up to do other things because someone else does that, that, that work for us, even wh whether it makes us better people or not. I, I tend to think, that, yeah, when it comes to slaughtering animals, even if you go back in, in history, I mean, it, that tended to be a specialized occupation, even in the Middle Ages. I mean, there were certain people who knew how to do it well, and because others, average people, did not, and they made a botch out of it. <laughs> um, the fact that I did that makes me realize that if I did it on a regular basis, I would not view it as something odd. It's, it's not that far of a jump from doing other things that aren't that odd to me. Wouldn't it alter the complete fabric of civilization if we all started killing our own animals? It could. I mean, uh, this brings to mind my father-in-law, who used to regularly kill chickens for the family. This is India. In the old days, you had to do it. You'd buy a chicken, it'd be running around, and my wife used to tell me how they'd see chickens all the time running around. That's just the way it is in the farm or India. And, uh, but the thing that really struck me was the impact that my daughter being on, a, on an organic farm had on her when she was asked, do you, she was given the choice, do you want to kill the poultry or not, the chicken or not? And she reflected and said, I eat it, I ought to kill it, and she killed it. So it's, it's a moral or ethical decision you take. I think that's an important aspect of it. I mean, I, I think that there's sort of a symbolically, just look at GW where it's located. 
Um, this used to be the site of many slaughterhouses. Mm. Now it's the site of a university. So, I mean, in terms of civilization, it seems to be a, I think, an advance. <laughs> And one of the first things that cities did as they became more progressive was to get the slaughterhouses out of sight, you know, mm -hmm. uh, because they were, it was, they were horrible places to, to be around. Um, so there is something about the civil, but on the other hand, it, too much of that, and then people are oblivious to everything, you know, and then mm -hmm. that's scary too, when they don't really know the cost and the price of, through the death of another animal of how they got their hamburger. I think that's too much. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah. We have time for one more question. There is one. Um, I w thank you very much, both of you. This was fabulous. Um, I, I mentioned, meant to mention at the start, actually, that um, Jose isn't here today because he's actually in Haiti trying to develop yeah, help people to you know, help themselves in Haiti and, and develop a, a food program there. Okay, so um, we'll see you next week. Thank you.